Hello, we are the Association for Child and Adolescent Mental Health, or ACAM for short. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Lauren Breeze and I'm a clinical psychologist. And um, throughout my uh, experience so far, I have worked with people with neurodevelopmental condition. Um, initially, my experience was working with people and children, um, and that's in CAMS, uh, through psychological therapy for uh, children with neurodevelopmental conditions, but also in diagnosis. And um, next, now I'm currently actually working with adults with a neurodevelopmental condition um, through diagnosis, but also in psychological therapy. So I've got a bit of a lifespan um, perspective. But today I'm hoping to uh, talk and think with you about um, formulation and where that might fit in our diagnosis and assessment of children and young people. But to begin today, I want to ask you a question. Okay, so could I have a show of hands for so the sky is blue? A show of hands for yes. Uh, a show of hands for no. Okay. So, if you have put your hand up for yes, I'm telling you, incorrect. Pause. Pause there. What does that feel like? Confusing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for your confusion. So confusing, yeah. Anybody else feel brave? What did it feel like to be told incorrect? Wrong. Annoying, yeah. <laughs> so uh, a belief that you've uh, held for a long time, you've maybe spoken to other people about, um, you have kind of all of a sudden come to this talk and to be told that you're wrong. Well, yeah, confusing. That's really annoying. Um, I suppose I was just thinking about well, what that might be like for people to come for an assessment for something that they might have researched online or. Um, met other people with a diagnosis of something and then to be told at the assessment actually that, that that's not the case we don't think you meet the criteria for a diagnosis of something they might that might be upsetting you might want to seek another opinion you might feel confused you know there are difficulties there but how might we explain them <coughs> and I think this is happening increasingly particularly for uh, children with neurodevelopmental conditions we're often presenting with emotional and behavioural difficulties alongside a neurodevelopmental diagnosis, or perhaps they're presenting with neurodevelopment um, so difficulties that might not necessarily meet the criteria for a diagnosis. And so we're seeing these young people in services and parents or teachers um, or other people who are involved with the child's care are concerned about a specific diagnosis, ADHD or autism, and they, they might be quite invested in that um, diagnosis and feel like it explains a lot. And they come to the appointment after probably what is a long period of waiting, um, which builds the anticipation, expecting an answer from the person that they're, they're coming to see. And so, you know, we talked a bit about diagnosis. Diagnoses are useful. Um, they might define the problem in a certain way against a standardised set of criteria. Um, it also then opens up uh, the treatment, so what next? It's a quick reference for understanding people. Um, if somebody has a diagnosis, you, know, you, you, have, you might have an idea of what that might mean or what that might look like for the young person. And that's, that's, that's um, useful. And also a lot of the time a diagnosis or having a diagnosis of a neurodevelopmental condition <coughs> might give you access to the system, so access to CAMS or um, so different services that provides treatment or help. However, there are certain challenges with diagnosis. Um, they aren't kind of providing information necessarily about that individual as a person. So one person with a diagnosis of autism is going to likely to be different from another person with a diagnosis, the same with ADHD or other neurodevelopmental conditions. They might not take into account the context. Well, they, they don't take into account the context that that person developed in. So, what are their social? What's their social context? What's their relationship context? What's their cultural family context? And a diagnosis or a label doesn't take that into account. 
it doesn't take into account how many diagnoses, what personal meaning those difficulties or differences have, or what the impact is of those differences. And then what happens if uh, difficulties are clearly present for that child, um, but perhaps they don't reach the threshold, so they, they don't necessarily have to meet those, a number of um, diagnostic criteria that, uh, uh, that are necessary to have to receive that diagnosis. What happens if the child needs more time to develop? You need to do some watching and waiting. Um, what happens if there are separate difficulties, or for example, environmental factors, or external factors that are separate from the presentation. So maybe a diagnosis is present, but what about all of these other things that are clearly having an impact and are really challenging for the child or the family? Um, that it's just not captured in a label or, or, or um, one certain uh, black and white way of looking at things. Um, maybe the clinician is unsure. Not you know we need more time. We need more extra information. Some of the challenges that Mark was uh, thinking about in the challenges of diagnosing. And often people might be hoping for a clear-cut explanation, but that it might not necessarily be as black and white as, um, as they might hope. So this is where I'm uh, introducing this idea of formulation, which might be familiar to some of you. And for, uh, what is a formulation? I like to describe it a bit like a road map. Uh, so a road map of somebody's difficulties of how they might have developed, how they might have come to be where they are currently, um, what roadblocks might they have overcome, what challenges uh, or roundabouts might there be on that journey ahead of them. So a formulation is a structured narrative, a story of making sense of somebody's difficulties, how they developed in their context, taking into account social, cultural, relationship factors, what might be keeping them going in the present moment, and what the family or the child is making, how they're making sense of those difficulties or differences. And it uses psychological theory to kind of understand aspects of the child's presentation. And formulation can be simple, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, a brief framework that we can use to formulate some difficulties. It can also be complex. There are other psychological, psychological theories around different types of formulations that psychologists might use. But something that's really important about formation is that it guides treatment. So it can help you to come up with a plan um, in the same way as a diagnosis can. Um, it actually points out potential uh, opportunities for differences to be made. And what I like about formulation, it thickens the narrative of a diagnosis. So it becomes a story that uh, the parents and the children can really engage with and to explain how their problems might have developed and how they're keeping on going. And it brings together multiple perspectives. So it, it becomes less of a yes, no, either or, the sky is blue, it's not blue. It's a yes, the sky might be blue sometimes and also it can be different colours. Um, and it's developed often collaboratively with parents, so using their language which can be really empowering. And it helps other people to understand the child more broadly. So in the same way a diagnosis might be a quick reference guide for understanding uh, somebody, the same as formulation. It can uh, guide people's understanding more broadly. And it's taking into account biological aspects, psychological, social aspects, to create a shared understanding. Okay. Yeah, more about formulation. <laughs> so it, it can highlight any gaps in knowledge. So if you're, uh, if you realise that you actually might want to be more curious about a certain area, formulation can can, uh, can guide that. And it can be quite validating for parents to come away with an understanding about their child that um, either whether they receive a diagnosis or not. Uh, that somebody has heard them, heard what the difficulties are, and this is our understanding of where we currently are, and this is what the treatment plan might be. And in my opinion, it can be used alongside diagnosis. It can be used um, as a, yeah, they really go well together. Um, it doesn't have to be an either or. Okay, so just introducing a, a simple framework to, um, to kind of you know, what do I mean by formulation? And this is a framework that lots of psychologists use um, 
called the five P's. Uh, well, and I'll go into each P, don't worry. So the presenting, predisposing, precipitating, perpetuating, protective factors. And I like to add in an extra P because I like to come up with a plan. Okay, so this is just a brief diagram of how they might fit together. So um, what are the past issues? How might they be influencing the, the triggers? How might they be influencing the current issues? What's keeping things stuck? What's going really well? And what the plan is? We can come back to that. Okay, so to make this a bit more real, I'm just going to be thinking about a quick case study. Um, and imagine you're referred a six-year-old boy, referral comes from school. Mum is reporting this child as having angry outbursts and challenging behaviour, such as spitting, kicking, hitting. And he has a diagnosis of a language delay. And mum comes into the appointment, she's very, very stressed. She's really understandably concerned, trying to manage this child's behaviour, really struggling. And she has spoken to lots of people, researched online, she's certain that the child has a diagnosis of autism and, and just really wants some help. She describes him pick, uh, pushing and kicking other children, having no sense of danger, running out into the road, um, not discerning between strangers and friends, talking to everybody and really very tearful, emotionally labile, struggling to follow instructions, and problems sleeping, waking up a lot in the nights, very tearful, really kind of hard to um, comfort. However, when you meet the child, very sociable, very, very uh, personable in the clinic, um, she, she kind of, although non, kind of struggling with language, maybe showing you things, um, modulating the eye contact with you, pointing things out, playing imaginatively. So immediately you're kind of wondering, maybe ruling out autism as a possible uh, presenting difficulty, but clearly there are challenges. So how to how to go about having this conversation with the parent, or how to, how to go about understanding some of these difficulties in more broad detail. So we might take the first P, presenting. What are the current issues? How how is the parent describing what's going on? How is the child making sense of their difficulties? And what did you observe? And that can come, that can fall under uh, these categories. So biologically, what are the presenting difficulties? Uh, is there anything going on biologically? Is there a chromosomal disorder? Is there um, physical health difficulties? Socially, what's uh, happening? What is their social context? Are there any cultural factors that you need to be aware of or that are influencing the presenting um, difficulties? What's their mood like? What are the psychological, um, uh, you know, any psychological difficulties that are presenting? Are they tearful? Are they low in mood? What's their cognition like? Um, is there, are there any learning delays? Are there, um, and what, what is, is there any difficulties in their behaviour? So are they presenting with challenging behaviour? And, the, the key thing about this aspect of um, this P is to be quite detailed. So to go into detail, so rather than challenging behaviour, maybe thinking about their kicking um, three times, for example, at this specific time. So really nailing down the detail. So for this case example, so this person's a six-year-old boy presenting as tearful and anxious. School have reported him um, being very challenging, hitting and pushing other children in terms of his behaviour. Mum reporting no sense of danger. Waking up three and four times a night distress. So a, a just descriptive narrative of the presenting difficulties encompassing some of those aspects that were the bullet pointed. Okay, so far so good. So next is thinking about the predisposing factors. So really that just means past events. So what are the historical setting events that might have contributed to some of these presenting difficulties. And that could be in their personal history. So, for example, whether there are neurodevelopmental difficulties in the family, are there any mental health difficulties in the family? Are there any genetic difficulties in the family? So personal history-wise, but also in the context. So have they, you know, have there been any adverse childhood events? Are there any difficulties in the parent-child relationship? any difficulties in the wider family um, or their social circumstances, perhaps they've had to move house four or five times in the last year. So 
the, uh, these past events are predisposing events or factors are anything in their history that may have contributed to making the difficulties at the moment more likely to be present. So from this case, this child was born um, and was taken to live with his aunt in America, which was um, very usual for their uh, culture. And the aunt and the child had a really close relationship. And un through unforeseen sort of circumstances, the child moved back to the UK with his mother two years ago. And of course, as a historical kind of um, predisposing factor, that might have uh, been a huge change for the child and the whole family. Second, the mother reported to be socially isolated. So she said to you that she, you know, she's really struggling because she doesn't have any additional people around her that might be able to support her or to be able to help. So why is that important? Well, because her feelings of stress and uh, feelings of not being heard are ha you know, likely to be having an impact on the child's presentation. So it's really important to include in the formulation, which would be not necessarily included in or kind of encompassed in a diagnosis. For example, the language delay uh, might be a setting event if the child is struggling to understand verbal instructions, then he might be displaying some of his feelings through his behaviour. So these kind of historical or background factors are really important in understanding that child's presentation. The precipitating factors, so triggers. What particular triggers are there for the presenting difficulties? So you might be thinking, well, when is this behaviour more or less likely to happen? So you might be considering social factors. Who is there? What is the, the social context? Biological factors. Are they tired? Are they hungry? I know that could be a trigger for me. Um, in the context, what exactly is happening? So are they more likely to be challenging when they get back from school, for example? Or is it in a certain lesson that they display challenging behaviour? So for this child, um, particularly when this child is asked uh, particular instructions, that we're seeing the challenging behaviour. And particularly in the night time, when he has woken up, he's fallen asleep on the sofa but he wakes up in the bed particularly when mum is finding that very difficult to manage when the child is very tearful okay so maintenance factors so i would say your triggers and maintenance factors are the, are the key areas where you might be able to think about a plan for, uh, for intervention so perpetuating factors what is keeping this these difficulties going in this present moment and that might be biological, psychological, things in the system, things uh, in the parenting or inconsistencies, things in the social network or consequences for the behaviour. So what might be maintaining these presenting difficulties, making it more likely to happen? Um, so for this case example, um, for example, when, he, when the child is asked to do something he doesn't want to do, uh, he he ends up not having to do it, and therefore that is reinforcing the challenging behaviour. So it's making it more likely that he is going to use that strategy again to, to, to achieve the same outcome. Another maintenance factor might be the social isolation, because if then, oh, yes, it is a setting event, but also it might be keeping going mum's stress levels, and therefore this is something that we need to be thinking about managing or helping mum to manage, because that's going to be keeping some of the behaviour going in the present moment. And thinking about ways mum or dad might be responding to the um, behaviour. If it's inconsistent, it might be inadvertently reinforcing it, making it more likely to happen. Okay, and the, the fifth thing, but no, like not the least B, um, thinking about protective factors. So what are the family's strengths? So in each family, everybody is going to have things that, that are going well and it's important to ask about them, important, you know, important to think about what is helping at the moment. And that might be personally, it might be at home, at school, that the parents are there in front of you trying to ask for help, um, that they have an engaged senko or they're achieving well. So really important to think about the protective factors um, and what might be lessening the impact of the difficulties. So if this child's attending school, highly motivated, mum's engaged. So the final P, thinking about the plan, and as I said, 
the key areas are around the maintenance factors or potential triggers. So for this person, consider minimizing any triggers that are present. So discussing sleep routine with, with the parent, discussing their consistency of rewards or consequences, or how they might be giving instructions, addressing any maintenance factors like mum's isolation or mental health, or addressing any of the presenting difficulties that may not have been, uh, may not have had intervention. So this is where the formulation is useful in highlighting any gaps. For example, the language delay might require a referral to speech and language therapy. Um, and it also might highlight a, a need for parenting intervention for, for the parent. So really, I suppose what I'm trying to say is the formulation is helpful to thicken that narrative that the sky is blue, but there might also be other factors that are going on that are really important that we need to know about that can describe the child um, and, and, and to support that child. So formulation can help to understand the child in their context, use a psychological theory to, um, to understand what's going on, it shares a responsibility, so it's generally collaborative, so um, it's an understanding of the child from the parent and the child's perspective and from your perspective. It's not just a, um, something that is, is given to the child, it's very much collaboratively developed and highlights any gaps in knowledge and guides treatment. So I think we use alongside that basis. Okay, perfect. To be part of the advancement of child and adolescent mental health, visit www.acamh.org.